I never knew anyone so keenly alive to a joke as the king was. He seemed to live only for joking. To tell a good story of the joke kind, and to tell it well, was the surest road to his favor. Thus it happened that all his seven ministers were noted for their accomplishments as jokers. They all took after the king, too, in being large, corpulent, oily men, as well as inimitable jokers. Whether people grow fat by joking, or whether there's something in fat itself which predisposes to a joke, I have never quite been able to determine, but it's certain that a lean joker is a rara abbess in terrace. About the refinements, or as he called them, the ghosts of wit, the king troubled himself very little. He had an especial admiration for the breadth of a jest, and would often put up the length for the sake of it. Over niceties wearied him. He would have preferred Rebella's Gargantua to the Zadig of Voltaire, and upon the whole, practical jokes suited his taste far better than verbal ones. At the date of my narrative, professing jesters had not altogether gone out of fashion at court. Several of the great continental powers still retained their fools, who wore motley with caps and bells, and who were expected to always be ready with sharp witticisms at a moment's notice, in consideration of the crumbs which fell from the royal table. Our king, as a matter of course, retained his fool. The fact is, he required something in the way of folly, if only to counterbalance the heavy wisdom of the seven wise men who were his ministers, not to mention himself. His fool, or professional jester, was not only a fool, however. His value was trebled in the eyes of the king by the fact of his also being a dwarf and a cripple. Dwarfs were as common at court in those days as fools, and many monarchs would have found it difficult to get through their days, days are rather longer at court than elsewhere, without both a jester to laugh with and a dwarf to laugh at. But, as I have already observed, your jesters, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, are fat, round, and unwieldy. So it was no small source of self-gratulation with our king, in Hot Frog, that was the fool's name, he possessed triplicate treasure in one person. I believe the name Hot Frog was not that given to the dwarf by his sponsors of baptism, but it was conferred on him by general consent of the seven ministers, on account of his inability to walk as other men do. In fact, Hot Frog could only get along by sort of an interjectional gait, something between a leap and a wriggle, a movement that afforded illimitable amusement and, of course, consolation to the king, for, notwithstanding the protuberance of his stomach and a constitutional swelling of the head, the king, by his whole court, was accounted a capital figure. But although Hot Frog, through the distortion of his legs, could move only with great pain and difficulty along a road or floor, the prodigious muscular power which nature seemed to have bestowed upon his arms by way of compensation for a deficiency in the lower limbs enabled him to perform many feats of wonderful dexterity where trees or ropes were in question, or anything else to climb. At such exercises, he was certainly much more resembled a squirrel or a small monkey than a frog. I'm not able to say with precision from what country Hot Frog originally came. It was some barbarous region, however, no person had ever heard of, a vast distance from the court of our king. Hot Frog, and a young girl very little less dwarfish than himself, although of exquisite proportions and a marvelous dancer, had been forcibly carried off from the respective homes in adjoining provinces, and sent as presents to the king by one of his ever-victorious generals. Under these circumstances, it's not to be wondered at that a close intimacy arose between the two little captives. Indeed, they soon became sworn friends. Hot Frog, although made a great deal of sport, was by no means popular, and had not in his power to render Trepetta many services. But she, on account of her grace and exquisite beauty, although a dwarf, was universally admired and petted, so she possessed much influence and never failed to use it wherever she could for the benefit of Hot Frog. On some grand state occasion, I forget what, the king determined to have a masquerade, and whenever a masquerade or anything of that kind occurred at court, then the talents both of Hot Frog and Trepetta were sure to be called into play. Hot Frog, in especial, was so inventive in the way of getting up pageants, suggested novel characters, and arranging costumes for masked balls, that nothing could be done, it seems, without his assistance. The night appointed for the fate had arrived. A gorgeous hall had been fitted up under Trepetta's eye, with every kind of device which could possibly give a clay to a masquerade. The whole court was in a fever of expectation. As for costumes and characters, it might well be supposed that everyone had come to a decision on such points. Many had made up their minds as to what roles they should assume a week or even a month in advance. And in fact, there was not a particle of indecision anywhere, except in the case of the king and his seven ministers. Why they hesitated, I can never tell, unless they did it by way of a joke. More probably, they found it difficult, on account of being so fat, to make up their minds. At all events, time flew, and as a last resort, they sent for Trepetta and Hot Frog. 
When the two little friends obeyed the summons of the king, they found him sitting at his wine with the seven ministers of his cabinet council, but the monarch appeared to be in a very ill humor. He knew that Hot Frog was not fond of wine, for it excited the poor cripple almost to madness, and madness is no comfortable feeling. But the king loved his practical jokes, and took pleasure in forcing Hot Frog to drink, and, as the king called it, to be merry. Come here, Hot Frog, he said as the jester and his friend entered the room. Swallow this bumper to the health of your absent friends, here Hot Frog sighed, and let us have benefit of your invention. We want characters, characters, man, something novel, out of the way. We are wearied with this everlasting sameness. Come, drink, the wine will brighten your wits. Hot Frog endeavored, as usual, to get up a jest in reply to these advances from the king, but the effort was too much. It happened to be the poor dwarf's birthday, and the command to drink to his absent friends forced tears to his eyes. Many large, bitter drops fell in the goblet as he took it only from the hand of the tyrant. Aha! roared the latter, as the dwarf reluctantly drained the beaker. See what a glass of good wine can do? Why, your eyes are shining already. The poor fellow, his eyes gleamed rather than shone, for the effect of wine on his excitable brain was not more powerful than instantaneous. He placed the goblet nervously on the table and looked around the company with a half-insane stare. They all seemed highly amused at the success of the king's joke. And now down to business, said the Prime Minister, a very fat man. Yes, said the king. Come, lend us your assistance. Characters, my fine fellow. We stand in need of characters, all of us. And as this was seriously meant for a joke, his laughter was coursed by the seven. Hop Frog also laughed, although feebly and somewhat vacantly. Come, come, said the king impatiently. Have you nothing to suggest? I am endeavoring to think of something novel replied the dwarf abstractedly, for he was quite bewildered by the wine. Endeavoring, cried the tyrant fiercely. What do you mean by that? Ah, I perceive. You are sulky and you want more wine. Here, drink this. And he poured out another goblet full and offered it to the cripple, who merely gazed at it, gasping for breath. Drink, I say, shouted the monster, or by the fiends. The dwarf hesitated. The king grew purple with rage. The courtiers smirked. And Trapetta, pale as a corpse, advanced to the monarch's seat, and falling to her knees before him, implored him to spare her friend. The tyrant regarded her for some moments in evident wonder at her audacity. He seemed quite at a loss as to what to do or say, how most becomingly to express his indignation. At last, without uttering a syllable, he pushed her violently from him and threw the contents of the brimming goblet in her face. The poor girl got up as best she could, and not daring even to sigh, resumed her position at the foot of the table. There was a dead silence for about a half a minute, during which the falling of a leaf or a feather might have been heard. It was interrupted by a low but harsh and protracted grating sound which seemed to come at once from every corner of the room. "'What, what, what are you making that noise for?' demanded the king, turning furiously to the dwarf. The latter seemed to have recovered in great measure from his intoxication, and looking fixedly but quietly in the tyrant's face, merely ejaculated, "'I? I? How could it have been me?' The sound appeared to come from without, observed one of the courtiers. I fancy it was a parrot at the window, wetting his bill upon his cage wires. True, replied the monarch, as if much relieved by the suggestion, but on the honor of a knight I could have sworn it was the grating of this vagabond's teeth. Hereupon the dwarf laughed. The king was too confirmed a joker to object to anyone's laughing, and displayed a set of large, powerful, and very repulsive teeth. Moreover, he avowed his perfect willingness to swallow as much wine as desired. The monarch was pacified, and having drained another bumper with no very perceptible ill effect, Hop Frog entered at once and with spirit into the plans of the masquerade. I cannot tell you what was the association of the idea, observed he very tranquilly, as if he'd never tasted wine in his life, but just after your majesty had struck the girl and thrown the wine in her face, just after your majesty had done this, and while the parrot was making that odd noise outside the window, there came into my mind a capital diversion. One of my own country frolics, often enacted among us at our masquerades, but here it will be all together. Unfortunately, it requires a company of eight persons, and here we are, cried the king, laughing at his acute discovery of the coincidence, eight to a fraction, I and my seven ministers. Come, what is the diversion? We call it, replied the cripple, the eight chained orangutans, and it really is excellent sport if well enacted. We will enact it, remarked the king, drawing himself up and lowering his eyelids. The beauty of the game, continued Hop Frog, lies in the fright it occasions among the women. Capital, roared in chorus the monarch and his ministry. I will equip you as orangutans, proceeded the dwarf. Leave all that to me. 
The resemblance shall be so striking that the company of masqueraders will take you for the real beasts, and of course there will be as much terrified as astonished. Oh, this is exquisite, exclaimed the king. Hopfrog, I will make a man of you. The chains are for the purpose of increasing the confusion by their jangling. You are supposed to have escaped en masse from your keepers. Your majesty cannot conceive the effect produced at a masquerade by eight chained orangutans, imagined to be real ones by most of the company, and rushing in with savage cries among a crowd of delicately and gorgeously habited men and women. The contrast is inimitable. It must be, said the king, and the council arose hurriedly, as it was growing late, to put into execution the scheme of Hop Frog. His mode of equipping the party as orangutans was very simple, but effective enough for his purposes. The animals in question had, at the epoch of my story, very rarely been seen in any part of the civilized world, and as the imitations made by the dwarf were sufficiently beast-like and more than sufficiently hideous, their truthfulness to nature was thus thought to be secured. The king and his ministers were first encased in tight-fitting stockinette shirts and drawers. They were then saturated with tar. At this stage of the process, someone of the party suggested feathers, but the suggestion was at once overruled by the dwarf, who soon convinced the ape by ocular demonstration that the hair of such a brute as the orangutan was much more efficiently represented by flax. A thick coating of the latter was accordingly plastered upon the coating of tar. A long chain was now procured. First, it was passed about the waist of the king and tied, and then about another of the party and also tied, then about all successively in the same manner. When this chaining arrangement was complete, the party stood as far apart from each other as possible, they formed a circle, and to make all things appear natural, Hop Frog passed the residue chain in two diameters at right angles across a circle, after the fashion adopted at the present day, by those who capture chimpanzees and other large apes in Borneo. The grand saloon in which the masquerade was to take place was a circular room, very lofty, and receiving the light of the sun only through a single window at top. At night, the season for which the apartment was especially designed, it was illuminated principally by a large chandelier depending by a chain from the center of the skylight, and lowered or elevated by means of a counterbalance as usual. But in order not to look unsightly, this ladder passed outside a cupola and over the roof. The arrangements of the room had been left to Trepetta's superintendence, but in some particulars, it seems, she had been guided by the calmer judgment of her friend the dwarf. At his suggestion, it was that on this occasion the chandelier was removed. Its waxen drippings, which in weather so warm was quite impossible to prevent, would have been seriously detrimental to the rich dresses of the guests who, on account of the crowded state of the saloon, could not all be expected to keep out of its center, that is to say, from under the chandelier. Additional sconces were set in various parts of the halls out of the way, and a flambeau emitting sweet odor was placed at the right hand of each of the caryatids which stood against the wall, some fifty or sixty altogether. The eight orangutans, taking Hop Frog's advice, waited patiently until midnight when the room was thoroughly filled with masqueraders before making their entrance. No sooner had the clock ceased striking, however, than they rushed, or rather rolled in, altogether, for the impediments of their chain caused most of the party to fall, and all to stumble as they entered. The excitement among the masqueraders was prodigious, and filled the heart of the king with glee. As had been anticipated, there were not a few of the guests who supposed the ferocious-looking creatures to be beasts of some kind in reality, if not precisely orangutans. Many of the women swooned with affright, and had not the king taken the precaution to exclude all weapons from the saloon, his party might have soon expiated their frolic in blood. As it was, a general rush was made for the doors, but the king had ordered them locked immediately upon his entrance, and, at the dwarf's suggestion, the keys had been deposited with him. While the tumult was at its height, and each masquerader attentive only to his own safety, for in fact there was much real danger from the pressure of the excited crowd, the chain by which the chandelier ordinarily hung, and which had been drawn up on its removal, might have been seen to very gradually descend until its hooked extremity came within three feet of the floor. Soon after this, the king and his seven friends, having reeled about the hall in all directions, found themselves at length in its center, and of course in immediate contact with the chain. While they were thus situated, the dwarf, who had followed noiselessly at their heels, inciting them to keep up the commotion, took hold of their own chain at the intersection of the two portions, which crossed the circle diametrically at right angles. Here, with the rapidity of thought, he inserted the hook from which the chandelier had been wont to depend, and, in an instant, by some agency, the chandelier chain was drawn so far upward as to take the hook out of reach, and as an inevitable consequence to drag the orangutans together in close connection, face to face. The masqueraders by this time had recovered in some measure from their alarm, and beginning to regard the whole matter as a well-contrived pleasantry, set up a loud shout of laughter at the predicament of the apes. Leave them to me, now screamed Hop Frog, his shrill voice making itself easily heard through all the din. 
Leave them to me. I fancy I know them. If I can only get a good look at them, I can soon tell you who they are. Here, scrambling over the heads of the crowd, he managed to get to the wall. When seizing a flambeau from one of the caryatids, he returned as he went to the center of the room, leaping with the agility of a monkey upon the king's head, and thence clambered a few feet up the chain, holding down the torch to examine the group of orangutans, and still screaming, I shall soon find out who they are. And now, while the whole assembly, the apes included, were convulsed with laughter, the jester suddenly uttered a shrill whistle. When the chain flew up violently for about thirty feet, dragging with it the dismayed and struggling orangutans, and leaving them suspended mid-air between the skylight and the floor. Hop Frog, clinging to the chain as it arose, still maintained his relative position in respect to the eight maskers, and still, as if nothing were the matter, continued to thrust his torch down toward them, as though endeavoring to discover who they were. So thoroughly astonished was the whole company at this ascent that a dead silence of about a minute's duration ensued. It was broken by just such a low, harsh, grating sound, as had before attracted the attention of the king and his counselors when the former threw the wine in the face of Trepetta. But on the present occasion, there could be no question as to whence the sound issued. It came from the fang-like teeth of the dwarf who ground them and gnashed them as he foamed at the mouth and glared with an expression of maniacal rage at the upturned countenances of the king and his seven companions. Aha! at length said the infuriated jester. Aha! I begin now to see who these people are. Here, pretending to scrutinize the king more closely, he held the flambeau to the flaxen coat which enveloped him, and which instantly burst into a sheet of vivid flame. In less than half a minute, the whole eight orangutans were blazing fiercely amid the shrieks of the multitude who gazed at them from below, horror-stricken, and without the power to render them the slightest assistance. At length, the flames, suddenly increasing in virulence, forced the jester to climb higher up the chain to be out of their reach, and as he made this movement, the crowd again sank for a brief instant into silence. The dwarf seized this opportunity and once more spoke. I now see distinctly what manner of people these maskers are. They are a great king and his seven privy counselors, a king who does not scruple to strike a defenseless girl and his seven counselors who abet him in the outrage. As for myself, I am simply Hop Frog the Jester, and this is my last jest. Owing to the high combustibility of both the flax and the tar to which it adhered, the dwarf had scarcely made an end of his brief speech before the work of vengeance was complete. The eight corpses swung in their chains, a fetid, blackened, hideous, and indistinguishable mass. The cripple hurled his torch at him, clambered leisurely to the ceiling, and disappeared through the skylight. It is supposed that Trepetta, stationed on the roof of the saloon, had been the accomplice of her friend in this fiery revenge, and that together they effected their escape to their own country for neither was seen again.